Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. If you have been anywhere near the C64 demo scene for the last two years, you would have seen the immense amount of releases from Fairlight's demo section over that period. And the root cause for that is the uh, recruitment of Adam Dunkels trident he's been absolutely massively productive bringing so much energy introducing so many new effects to the c64 scene exploring the ghost bite in ways which have been sort of instrumental to changing that big feature into being an, an integral part of any successful demo so I've been fortunate enough to have a very long time with Adam where we look a bit of his professional and personal and also scene background. And then we have the director's comment on him from one of the or two of the recent releases, uh, No Sprites and also The Ghost. Two super releases uh, that we would like to have you see in the gory details. So, over to Trident. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV with the main star of Fairlight demo activity currently, Trident, Adam Dunkels. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me. All good. Very good, thank you. Um, it's a, uh, it's I, a I lovely Friday. I guess you've seen a few of those before, so you are sort of prepared for, for what will come. But we will have a bit of a discussion on your, like you as a person, and uh, a bit on touching on your pri uh, your professional side as well. And then we will go into the scene persona Trident's his history. And one of the things I know people love is sort of the director's comment on the products you have been doing. So we will look at uh, Ghost and we will look at uh, No Sprites, right? Yeah. These are the two we prepared. So let's kick this off. So, I mean, Adam, you are, besides being a super handsome guy, you are from a super great gene pool. Your father was a university math, math teacher and your mom is a math professor, right? So, um, yeah, <laughs> you seem to come from like a math family. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've, I've been growing up very much in a, around mathematics and uh, academic environment, certainly. And and your sister Elsa, um, I mean, she's she's sort of in the border of this. Uh, Elsa Dunkels is, is a person that if you live in Sweden, you might have heard of her because she's constantly, uh, well, uh, putting articles out there in publics on around internet because she's a very known figure for internet and cultures on the internet. So, what does Elsa say about the scene? Yeah, so I think I mean she's very much into kind of the mainstream uh, area of, of like internet culture was has always been in that that place, and I think what we're have been doing have, has been more of a I don't know a, kind of a niche thing uh, by by its very nature. I mean that yeah. was always the it was all supposed to be like elite thing, right? Yeah. And uh, I think there was a it was never so mainstream as the general internet, so. Uh, I guess it's, it's not really her thing in that sense. Well, it depends on where you sort of put the base of the pyramid. If if people yeah. involved in uh, spreading and everything is sort of the base. But for me, the, the base is actually the gamers playing the cracked games and, and those interested in the art of demo, watching demos done by others and not even being involved. But But to me, they are sort of the base. So... It yeah. was, I'd say it was mainstream back in the 80s, less so now than it was then, but still. Um, mm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the, I think the, the thing was that it was in the 80s and 90s, it was still not so mainstream as it was late 90s when the Internet started really pushing through because it was still, I mean, counting the number of people who had a computer in every classroom, mm -hmm. it would be like a one or two, maybe three. 
um, in the 80s, like 90s, it started increasing and, and late 90s, it would be everyone. So in that sense, it was still a very niche phenomenon. It was not something that, that people would do like uh, every day. It was, was really a, a few people involved. So Right. Uh, well, guess, and, uh, and one of the things you could say is probably there are a few, as you mentioned, there are fewer people back then who were into computers, but a bigger share yeah. of those were sort of involved in some sort of a scene. But nowadays, yeah. like when everybody is having a computer, um, it might be that in absolute numbers, we are sort of the same we were back then, yeah. but, but our share of the total population is so much smaller. It definitely went down. <laughs> Which is sort of also this is the kind of mathematics down your alley, I would say. So, but you are a doctor of technology. I'm a lame master yeah. of law, but you are actually a doctor of technology. <laughs> what, yeah. what was sort of your niche there? So yeah, I did my my PhD thesis was on uh, pretty much actually the same thing as we we're talking about here, very much similar, uh, but also very different. I was I was uh, doing uh, wireless what we call wireless sense networks back then later redubbed as the internet of things and uh how to program uh this this kind of swarm of devices to do what we want them to do and very much a, a limitation thing as well because we're uh the the type of, of programming environments that that we would have on iot devices or, or wireless sense networks is not that similar uh, sorry not that far off from uh commodore 64 actually so uh much of the work that i did at you know, during my PhD studies and and later as well, very much kind of maps onto the the, the stuff that we, we were doing or I, I was doing, we were doing back in the 80s and 90s. So uh, it's, uh, I guess, very much a comfort zone there. Well, um, I mean, looking at what you did, what you have done is uh, this lightweight IP stack. It's commonly yeah. used. Uh, I mean, it's it's one of those things that sits in so many devices and yeah. uh, people aren't really aware that you are the guy behind that. And then also your UIP, which is a s smaller footprint. Is that for 8-bit and 16-bit computers, whereas lightweight is for 32 and up, I guess? Yeah, or 16-bit and up, but yeah. Okay. Definitely. It, it's, the, it's the smaller sibling, the younger one. So do elaborate. What kind of stuff would I use that use uh, a lightweight IP? So uh, I guess, you know, if you have any smart home devices that they would very likely be running the software. Mm -hmm. uh, I Maybe a TV. I'm not sure if a TV or, or uh, would go into that, but they might be a slightly larger guy now these days. But uh, certainly back you know, 15 years ago, TVs that were connected to, to Wi-Fi would have probably this code in it. So pretty much anything that is connected to Wi-Fi uh, that isn't a computer or a phone that uh, is likely to run the software. It's become the de facto standard in so many yeah. ways. So it's it's super cool to see. Uh, it's, it's really everywhere. Well, I mean, Daniel Steinberg, the guy behind Curl, has he been yeah. more successful in marketing the fact that he has been <laughs> producing code for billions of devices than you have? Or why why isn't you one of those guys <laughs> described in uh, XC, XKCD? The, uh, the, yeah. the, the little thing that a guy from Huddinge has coded that most of the internet relies on. But uh, you have also produced one of those yeah. components then. Yeah, I guess the 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 main difference there would be that that Daniel has always been maintaining a software. I mean, yeah. he's, he wrote it back in the day and has been just keeping at it. Yeah. I mean, doing a great job and of not just like writing software, but also writing blog posts and increasing awareness of his his, his project. And uh, plus the fact that curl is something that a lot of people actually kind of type in and run, mm -hmm. something that you're aware of running, mm -hmm. like you know of curl if you're if you're using a computer with a command line but no. uh whereas embedded software that just goes into stuff is more of a concern for the people that develop this uh that would ever see the code people don't even notice don't even know that there is code and things like it's it's still a it's still a uh it's just a thing it's something that sits there uh whereas a computer mm. where you type thing you type curl when you no. run it so but but definitely, I mean, this is it's it's interesting that that the two of us have this uh, little piece of impact <laughs> coming from pretty close in terms of 
like geographically close and uh i guess you could say like close in the terms of, of the culture of having grown up with the same really in the same uh the, you know the, the the same around the same people people and have been doing the same thing so uh there, there is that but uh I guess that the really the, the main difference is that he's been going at it and keeping his stuff. Whereas I, I, I did that maybe is it twenty something years ago now, and then I, I kind of didn't really work on it anymore. So yeah. you just uh, posted it and it's available on, on some Git repository and people can pick it up and they can implement it yeah. and uh, and so you're not adding anything. What about IPv6? Is that supported as well? I guess it is, right? It is, yeah. So people have added that. I, I think when I, so I basically, this was back in, I, I started this in back in the year 2000. And, and that was before Git, by the way. <laughs> that it's, it's that old. And released it to the world, a couple of releases there. And then mm -hmm. a group of other people kind of picked it up and, and just went with it and made it to what it is today. So I, you know, I, my involvement has been a few years in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then it's been, others that have just been pushing in, in, into this. And so you're no longer like the champion for it. There is somebody no. else uh, picked up the yeah. torch and run with it. So, um, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's um, move into sort of the C64 part of this, Contiki. Um, yeah. It didn't become like a, a big thing, which I guess it could have been, but uh, it that's also basically a, a Windows-based OS like Yeos or something, but uh, it starts with the IP stack, right? Right. Well, actually, success or not depends a bit on who you ask, uh, okay. I think, because it's uh, it started... So I did it as really uh, kind of a fun hobby thing mm -hmm. to begin with. Uh, like the Commodore 64 was the first platform, but it used the micro IP stack, which was something that I didn't in the past. And then I kind of wanted to just see how far it, it was possible to take something like this. So so the Contiki is an operating system. It does have a, a graphical component to it on the Commodore 64 that has been ported to the Apple II the Nintendo 8-bit, Atari 800, uh, PC Engine, like a bunch of these platforms that would not be reasonable to run a kind of graphical internet-enabled operating system on them, but it, it uh, does do that. But so that was kind of the starting point. And then I, I was pulling this into the uh, kind of the academic world, especially around the wireless sense networks. So because the the operating system as as such is not tied to any particular platform it's just uh you know it's just an OS so uh me and, and my colleagues started working on that as the kind of the basis for for uh a lot of the research that ultimately led to what we take for granted today like like matter smart home standard really traces mm -hmm. its roots down to this uh, and at the time there were there were like two competing platforms in this little uh, uh, research academic world. There was one from Berkeley called Tiny OS, and then there was Contiki, and big, big Tiny OS with uh, all the big major U.S. universities behind it, where they were kind of going at it. And they they were really, really good group of people doing that. Super smart, uh, you know, the the kind of guys that would later be uh, professors at Stanford and, and MIT and Berkeley were, uh, that's where they cut their teeth. And then there was Contiki on the other side. And ultimately, uh, what happened was that Contiki won. <laughs> so, <laughs> which was, was really, really cool to see. Uh, I, I, I was, there was a paper published by, by uh, a, a colleague from back then, Phil Levis, who was at Stanford, a professor at Stanford, uh, kind of chronologizing the, uh, the backstory of tiny os and contiki and he concluded and and so this paper was published at one of the kind of the top venues and it concluded that ultimately contiki kind of won which was uh uh to me a uh, kind of personal great you know success and it was so cool to see yeah. uh so in that sense you know asking people in that community did contiki become a big thing they would definitely say yes it's a major thing so uh, <laughs> whereas uh it was never really intended as a kind of a general purpose uh OS thing. It was more of a demo thing. Like it was, it was to just prove a point and do something insanely cool, uh, rather than do a kind of graphical OS as a tool. 
<laughs> and the name of it, Contiki, for me that uh, is sort of tied to Thor Heyerdahl and his raft. Oh, yeah. And uh, what is sort of the tie to that? Yeah, so the idea there was this was at a time, it was 2002, 2003-ish. And at the time there were, uh, the trend was to have web browser names uh, as, you know, there would be Nav Navigator, Explorer, Conqueror. Oh. They were all these big, you know, ideas of going out in the world. Netscape and Navigator, was... and the uh, exactly. it had one of those steering wheels uh, as yeah. a symbol back then as well. So exactly, and Explorer had a, a globe that, for you to explore, yeah. and there was the Conqueror, which was I think the KDE version of this. They they kind of picked up the name, so there was this this uh, the tied to the idea of exploration or or, or you know shipping. Uh, and then there was this this little raft, like <laughs> the one to wear it all, <laughs> Kentucky. Yeah, so the, I thought the, that would be a fun name. The most known raft in history. Exactly. Severely underpowered. <laughs> Yet they, they <laughs> took it across, you know, the oceans. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's a great connection. To that's a great background for a name. So uh, hat <laughs> off for that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, then now we're moving into something I, I've I mean, we we met personally a number of times and I asked you this, but I have to ask and you have to explain because I cannot relay this there is there is also one of the things that you have written a, a, a text on and that is proto threads. Uh, so please yeah, explain fine. and I'll just doze off because I realize I will not understand it this time either. So <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah, so proto threads is is a uh... A, a programming technique that that I came up with uh, very much together with Oliver Schmidt, uh, and when we were really doing in doing Kentucky, um, so it's a way to structure code similar to threads, like normal threads. And what you have when you're when you're programming with threads is that that you have those simultaneous kind of threads of control that run from start to finish. You kind of kind of sequentially you see them go. Mm -hmm. and you have a number of them the problem is that when you're in a very memory constrained environment each of these threads would re require their own stack like that's how the state of each thread is contained and the stack would have to be uh over provisioned so that it always is able to kind of have the top level of the stack inside it uh, you can't just allocate a small piece of stack and then hope it will work because you need that for, for the eventuality that you actually kind of push through. So you end up wasting a lot of memory. And if you have a system where you might have say 4K K of RAM, uh, suddenly you spend like 1K or 25% on stacks. Okay, so you don't want to do stacks. You, that leads people away from doing multi-threading. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you end up with is doing uh, all these convoluted state machines essentially, where the code goes all over the place. Uh, it makes it really, really hard to see what's going on in the code. So that's what you get from using threads. Uh, proto threads is a way to combine these two. Like what you get from from threading is the sequential flow control. Mm -hmm. So you know that first this, then that, then that, then that, which is extremely useful when you're when you're debugging the code, writing the code, especially if you're a group of people, because you can see what happens. Whereas in a in a state machine, you have code here do something code, they're doing something else, and they sort of tie it together with a little loop in the middle or, or a table or something. It makes it really hard. Mm -hmm. So proto threads allow you to do that kind of linear flow control, except you don't need to use stacks. What you have instead is basically you just maintain the state of where you were, mm -hmm. what the position of the code was, and you jump back to that. And you keep going, and then you have a new position of the code, you remember where you were, and then you jump back there the next time around. So all you need to, to remember is where you were, essentially the program counter. And that's enough to store the state of each proto thread. And by the way, the name is is the proto and proto thread should be understood as like a proto in the meaning of uh, something that came before, something more primitive form. Uh, like you have those languages, you have proto-Germanic or uh, mm -hmm. you know proto-Indo-European uh, languages. So so. Proto threads is as if there was a time before threads had stacks, mm -hmm. they would be proto threads. So, and the cool thing is that you can implement this in like five lines of C code. 
Mm -hmm. uh, super simple. Uh, you can implement it easily if you're doing assembly language. Super simple. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it's one of these things where uh, you look at it first, you, you just don't get it. But then you look at what actually goes on. You sort of scratch your head and think, oh, oh. And then you see what, what's actually going on. And it's really, really simple when you kind of get to that level. Um, so uh, I use it a lot uh, and, uh, and and doing uh, Commodore 64 stuff. And uh, have been using it a lot and throughout uh, you know, doing other things as well. But... but perhaps we should prepare for you actually explaining it and showing a piece of code and implementing it. Uh, I, I, that, that might eventually yeah. make me understand it. For, for me, it sounds like uh, Stacklet's uh, calls to subroutines, but... Uh... It is very much so. Definitely, definitely. That is the that is kind of the base case. But then you have an additional jump, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, so, it is it is uh, like a subroutine or like a coroutine without a stack, except you are uh, structured in a way that makes it linear instead of like a coroutine can be difficult uh, for other reasons. But, but certainly, let's do that. Cool. Cool. And uh, the next thing was uh, you were you became a researcher at RISE. Do tell what RISE is. I'm I'm sure not even Swedes would know that. Yeah, not even I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and you worked there twelve then, years or whatever yeah. it was. So. Well, uh, they changed names. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, what well, was that, it before? Yeah, it used to be called. Uh, or actually, so. I do actually know what Rice is, yeah. uh, but Rice. <laughs> I think it's 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 Research Institute Sweden, yeah. uh, and it is a collection of. It, it there used to be a bunch of, like, state owned or semi state owned research institutes all over the country, uh, that went they just went together uh, to form a larger mega corporation of of research mm. institutes so that they could rival, I guess, uh, big international. Uh, uh, institutes as well like like mm -hmm. frown offer mm -hmm. so but uh when i when i started there I, I did my master thesis there in the year 2000 it was called swedish institute of computer science six uh and it maintained that name i, I guess until 2015 16 ish sometime when they they all kind of joined up to become rice but but at the time so six was uh was actually really kind of early on uh, a number of things uh, started in, I think, I 85, 84, something. And uh, the reason I found six when I when I was looking for a master thesis, some, some cool you know place to do master thesis was that there is a uh, so th there is a, a, a mechanism inside the TCP protocol. So that one of the, the kind of the major uh, protocols inside the Internet, which is called the Karn Partridge algorithm. So it has to do with how TCP estimates the time it takes to, to send a packet from one end of the internet to the other end of the internet. Okay. So that's what all computers are doing all the time, trying to estimate this uh, to maintain the correct speed of each connection. Uh, so that is actually uh, constitutes of a number of, of algorithms. So one of them is called the, the, the Karn Partridge alg algorithm developed by by one guy called Phil Karn and Craig Partridge. Mm -hmm. So uh, two two guys. And uh, Craig Partridge had had done his sabbatical at six uh, in the 90s. So this the paper, the kind of the canonical URL for this paper back in 1999, if you went online to search for, for this particular algorithm, that paper was actually hosted at six.se. Uh, so it felt like so. Hey, this is a pretty cool place. I mean, not every place kind of has that that impact, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I I applied for a master thesis there, and and it it turned out really well. That was the light way IP stack, by the way. So which became a, a success uh, later as well. But so that was the, that was the backstory. So it was a uh, semi state owned, a semi uh, industry owned research institute. So. We were doing uh, kind of very academic research, but with a slight bent towards the more applied uh, kind of making good use of the stuff that, that that people were doing in academia. But we were very academic. 
And then you worked quite a lot with the uh, the LWYP there. So that's one of the things yeah. you continue to develop under this. And, and that was funded. Is that governmentally funded or was that funded yeah. by, by industry or? Yeah, the initial, the, the, actually the first project that I was working on was, I think, at least partly funded by Ericsson. Okay. But uh, then... Most of the, the work was funded by by Swedish uh, government uh, mm. through Vinova, SSF, mm. uh, the EU Commission, also mm. a big one, plus a bunch, uh, a number of uh, let's say uh, private actors like like uh, companies uh, Ericsson, mm. EBB, uh, mm. but but mostly was was kind of uh, government funded. And then you went private. Things yeah. squared from 2012 to December 2023. Right. Yeah. Things squared. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, I was have been doing this academic thing for quite some time, and really wanted to do something slightly different. But but uh, so we started a company uh, myself and 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 two of my co-founders. We call Things Square, and uh, we uh, really. So, so we developed and sold what I guess would be kind of the, the best uh, wireless mesh software in the world. Uh, that means that you can do you can do devices in the field with that can communicate with each other without any kind of uh, infrastructure involved. Mm -hmm. Like they would just find each other and and, and talk. And they take one of them or two of them or four of them or how many you want. Put uh, some kind of infrastructure on there, like a modem, and mm. boom, you have uh, um, an internet-connected set of of devices that that you can do whatever you want to do with. And uh, so we have we built some you know, twenty plus products based on this, you know, ranging from um, consumer-facing stuff like smart home devices uh, to uh, smart grid electricity stuff. Mm. Uh, street lights, uh, uh, a bunch of lighting uh, equipment, industrial lighting, industrial equipment, all kinds of things, and uh, did that for some time. Then felt that it, it would never really become a billion-dollar industry, and uh, sort of face it out and, and exited uh, December last year. And the, the uh, was that part of the matter standards, or were you involved in that as yeah. well, or? Because you referenced that uh, before, so yeah, uh, actually, no, not really. It uses the, so the matter standard and, and what things were what we were doing is very similar in terms of the technology. It's, it's based on IPv6 and it's based on meshing and it's based oh. on IEEE 8.2.15.4, except we were doing slightly different uh, applications, I guess. So the matter standard is uh, using 2.4 gigahertz, oh. so the, the, the same frequency as kind of old school Wi Fi. Which makes it work all over the world. Oh. Super, super useful if you're building a smart home oh. uh, device. Uh, we were uh, early on. We were kind of into that 2.4 thing, but we felt at uh, things where, but we felt that we would actually see more use cases where you'd have a slightly longer range of a sub one gigahertz uh, radio, and really went into that. But really very similar uh, technology, and and many of the people that. That I were, was working with back in the kind of academic research days mm. uh, are in the matter consortium now. Mm. Like we all know each other, and uh, so it's a uh, it's very similar in that sense. But matter is, of course, now kind of really bloomed out and uh, is uh, really really big and yeah. super cool. Yeah, well, I mean, th th there was a great need for uh, less fragmentation when you had the uh, Zigbee yeah. and Z-Wave and uh, yeah. um, people going in all different directions and, and producing yeah. stuff that would be compatible to multiple uh, like ways yeah. to talk uh, wirelessly to devices uh, made it very, very difficult. And, and uh, then yeah. making it simple enough to be consumer facing was basically a massive challenge. Yeah, it is. And it still is. I mean, matter is matter is the, the, so the cool thing with matter is that it has all the big players mm. uh, lined up around it. It has you know, Google, Amazon, uh, 
all the kind of the major players in that field kind of are there. And it's really uncommon for that to to happen. Mm-hmm. Like it hasn't happened until now, really. Everyone has been doing their own thing. Uh, Apple is there as well, by the way. So, and it's interesting to see how the because ultimately it's always kind of made out of people. Like mm. the people interact with each other, and and to see kind of the, the the guys from Apple, the guys from Google, getting together and working together uh, is really cool, uh, and it's happening, uh, but. So so it's uh, uh it's it's really cool. Yeah, when you see international standards, you tend to think, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of people, um, but you think companies are doing it. But eventually, it's boiling yeah. down to individuals driving, believing yeah. in stuff, and convincing their companies that this is something we should do, and then being able to collaborate with people. I mean, that's that's sort of where internet is from. Internet engineering yeah. task force and and forums such as that was well, somebody went off and, and did a thing and suggested that everybody should adopt it. And then they haggled a bit and ev- and everyone one and his brother had a little say and had a little tweak and a little change. And then ev- everybody agreed and then everybody went out to implement it. So yeah, that's sort of the yeah. the internet way when fragmentation is is only taking us so far i mean it's it's convenient that one company sets the standard and then just goes with it and and everybody else needs to tag along but uh eventually everybody participating tends to be a better thing it takes a bit longer but in the end that is better yeah definitely definitely that is interesting how you mentioned the, the ITF because I, I I see a lot of similarities with the the matter consortium now and the IETF. and yeah. most of that comes from people getting into the matter matter uh, consortium having kind of cut their teeth on the ITF. Mm-hmm. and I think that's a great thing because mm-hmm. uh, the ITF is really they re- really nailed a bunch of things around this. They they uh, as we see with it, the you know the success of the internet is I guess a testament to that. But mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, I never really understood the difference between uh, Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architect Board, but uh, we can uh-huh. leave that for some other discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know that. So, uh, <laughs> so December 2023, was that when you actually sort of left your professional career and started working doing demos for Fairlight full time? Or <laughs> are you doing something else in parallel to doing <laughs> a massive amount of demos for the C64? <laughs> Yeah, no, I yeah, no, I, I do work. <laughs> I do work occasionally. No, but but I, I definitely You know people uh, won't trust you work, when you but... say that, right? Yeah. You know, seeing the production level over the last like year and uh, more than a year, people would say, no, that work cannot take yeah. much time. Well, I, I actually I do work sort of half time. Uh so so that that I guess explains part of that. But but then I'm I I guess I'm just pretty I'm just really fast. Yeah. So that's proto threading, I guess. So <laughs> Oh yeah. It's all proto no, threading. Yeah, no, but seriously, I mean it, it used to be you know, working I, I I work from home now. It used to be like you'd go up in the morning and you'd be uh you know, taking a bus or the car or whatever, you know, for an hour mm. and you would sit there and not be able to do much. And you would be in, in the office and they would have another one and a half hour back. Mm. Whereas now, you know, you, you get out of bed and uh, you're just going to sit in there, which is for me the perfect time to kind of just do something. And I, I usually just do some some interesting programming. <laughs> and uh, if you're up at, say, six mm. and you have your, you know, your meetings start at nine, mm. well, that's three hours a day. Mm which is quite a lot of time, actually. I have to so, admit uh, that I spend all of that sleeping, but but that's me. So yeah, yeah. that's why you're more productive <laughs> than I am. So um, well, I, have, I, I have a pretty, I have a good coffee machine. Yeah, I do. I do as well, but uh, I need that to get out of bed, but uh, not to stay awake. So having seen a bit of how you work, I I see that you had this list of stuff that could be interesting to implement on the C64. Yeah, Yeah. that was a humongously big list. So anybody being afraid that Adam would run out of ideas, fear not. (laughs) The list is humongously big. Yeah, I don't know how many 
hundreds of lines yeah <laughs> that's really promising so let, let's let's take this back to your zine life you started up out um in cult around 1990 that's what csdb is telling me would that make oh, sense i i i think i have some entries before that though but oh. yeah around that time yeah and and this is a group where you you kind of shared group with vdk vodka was was he in the group yeah. at the same time as you or shit oh yeah so i i guess the story there is that i was in touch with so so the thing is i i, I grew up in the kind of far north of sweden where there weren't that many people around who were uh kind of into this this commodore 64 scene thing and uh there weren't that yeah. many people around the period but uh in even yeah. fewer <laughs> <laughs> it's not very yeah. densely populated <laughs> no well Wait, yeah no but there like, are but, there I are mean, urban yeah. areas and you lived in one of the urban yeah. areas so yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah but uh yeah definitely not being a populous area definitely is the problem there but so i, I but i got in touch with, with people around mm -hmm. like sweden uh and uh that was the other uh, way to, to move forward and i was in touch with with vdk uh early on and i think he and and uh and uh, trash started so pontus vong mm -hmm. uh started a cult and asked me to join uh, around that time and i was i was a brief member to a, a group called zombies at, uh, at some point there which i don't remember much but i think there were like two guys from maybe gothenburg yeah. uh the story of that i don't I, who i were in touch with they were like male uh oh. regular male and uh but it was a really really long time ago so it's like 1990 something so, so trash. Yeah. I I have to uh, relay the uh, the joke here. I, I I've met him a number of times, and and uh, one of the uh, pre Edison. So the Edison party and and uh, Trasher has this pre Edison thing, and uh, the Pontus was there, and I I <laughs> held him like that, and and <laughs> and I put up my camera and said, uh, well, now you know these are the two Pontuses. I'm Pontus Wright, and this is Pontus Wong. <laughs> and I laughed and yep. he didn't, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's Pontus Wong. Hi, Pontus. <laughs> so, and so zombies was something, and then uh, that moved into cult, or uh, is that the same thing with a new name or uh, no, membership? No, it's no. a bit different. Yeah, no, that was a complete diff completely different set of people. I mean, I, I don't know what happened to the, the, the guys in, in the zombies group. I I haven't seen anything more. I, I know that there was one demo released by Zombies. I think it released something for Zombies, but uh, I know that there was at least one demo called Not Last, which ended up being the last. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the story of the Zombies. <laughs> there will be a second coming of the Zombies uh, because it wasn't the oh, last yeah. one. <laughs> exactly. We know that. We've seen the movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we've also seen uh, people waiting for the second coming and they've been waiting for 2000 years and it didn't happen. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, there there are yeah. big followings exactly. of, of, uh, of ideas that should eventually come back. Yeah, could be like 2000 years from now, <laughs> yeah. people are still waiting for the zombies. It might be a big thing then. Yep. Who knows? <laughs> On the C64. Yes. <laughs> Okay, but uh, and then and this was basically a year. I mean, uh, I, I haven't recorded months or anything. But this is from ninety yeah. to ninety one, and then from ninety one to ninety two, you were in a, a group that even I would have heard of, and that was Antic. Yeah. And so again, yeah. this was VDK and Trash, but uh, they went along to Antic. But there, you also had HCL, you had uh, Deppe, you had Jordan, and a number of uh, yeah. I guess Creeper was there as well, right? So I think so too. Yeah. yeah. And did you, uh, um, did you meet them, or or I, was this uh, the way it was back then? You were a member by mail, so uh, yeah, contributions via post. Yeah, mostly like that. Definitely. I mean, I mean we had kind of, we were, I, I guess mostly stayed in touch over phone, um, but I was I visited. Uh, VDK and he visited me a couple times back and forth. So so we we were actually in kind of we, we met as well, but but mostly over like virtually. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Antigas, I think that where that was when we uh, met with that was uh, HCL and Garvin sort of joined there as well. And at some point, uh, I think it was again VDK and, and Trash that started Booze Design mm-hmm. and asked uh, me and ACL and Garvin to join. Mm-hmm. So we, I, I, maybe there were some more people as well. I, yeah, there were there was uh, there, uh, there were a couple other guys. Vital was there as well. There were there were a few others uh, starting out early on. That must have been ninety one ish. And we did a bunch of really like just for fun things there it was uh and uh much later you know hcl would take that torch and carry it like like crazy to make booze design the kind of the, the top group like ever and we, uh we, we did recruit uh, hcl and uh, and vdk into fairlight but oh. uh vdk stayed and hcl yeah. eventually jumped back so <laughs> I, I think his stay in fairlight was rather short and uh, vdk okay. is still around so yeah, yeah. booze is they are doing really well i have to say that yeah but <laughs> one of the interesting aspects which is also very strange when when you see the production you are doing today is that you did mostly music and some graphics you 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 did very little code no. if any in the no beginning. i started i started with coding that's where that's where i started okay so yeah no i i actually i did <laughs> so i guess like so many of us i was i was, I was super young mm-hmm. uh, and uh, i actually had before even getting my first Commodore 64, I was kind of into the idea of like programming uh, mm-hmm. machine code and started out with, you know, the, the basic statements and uh, the data statements and basic mm-hmm. poking into memory and do it extremely <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I mean, seriously. The branches, that, ooh, scary. Ooh, I wouldn't ooh, get yeah. that right. No, 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 no. And it wouldn't be very good. <laughs> like the code would not be good. But uh, that's that's how you had to do it before you had a proper like machine code monitor. Mm. Uh, but and and even with a machine code monitor, writing code in a machine code monitor is not good. I mean, it's terrible, mm. so bad. Moving uh, things around and uh, jumping to places, and then eventually putting the code there and uh, uh, and adding yeah. uh, three knobs to ensure that you can insert the uh, jump to subroutine yeah. later in case you need it. And uh, it becomes yeah. really inefficient. Uh, I would say it's, it's <laughs> very difficult to, to write really efficient code. It is. It is extremely inefficient. It's terrible. But, but I but, mean, yeah. C- CSDB is not really crediting you for code. You are mainly credited for music and graphics. Or was I no. researching um, sloppy here? I think it... Yeah, maybe I don't know. I you know, if I open CSDB, I definitely see a lot of credits there for code. Okay. okay. <laughs> so it might just be you. <laughs> okay. Let's let's skip that. Oh, you you were really into code early and, and you can yeah. read that on CSDB. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then uh, uh, 92 to 94, it was triad. So uh yeah. why leave boost design? Wasn't that like a, a super good spot for somebody interested in demo stuff? Yeah, I guess I, I guess you know, in hindsight, that was a mo- bad move, right? Uh, but I I think at the time I was I was I was friends with a lot of the triad guys as well. Mm. You know, at some point wanted to join, and I I was kind of recruited there, and uh, so it was mostly doing music there though. That was when when I started doing music a lot, but uh, and then kind of jumped off the scene yeah, mm. at some point there. Um, yeah, it seems but, like yeah. you had like a gap between, let's say, ninety four and ninety six, where yeah, you didn't do anything. Yeah, no, or, I was just or, doing. Or other. you do you did yeah. a lot of things, but not like in this context. Yeah, and then ninety six active, um, so surfer being sort of the girl's number one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And you had Trasher there, who was from Buwoden. I guess right. you knew him since before, yeah. right? I mean, uh, yeah. Again, you pointed out this not being a very densely populated place, and and Buwoden yeah. and uh, Luleå, they are really close. And if you look at the yeah. number of nerds locally, it would be rather few. So I would be yeah. surprised if you wouldn't know him. Right. Yeah. No. Actually, so so Peter Trasher and Riddler are, you know 
among they're, they're really my among my old, oldest friends like mm. uh, that i'm actively hanging out with today mm. so uh and we we met back back then in 91 ish and uh so so in 96 uh like peter so trasher and riddler they were they were the guys doing active and i just kind of jo- joined because we had so you know so much fun and we were doing all you know we were living pretty close together we were all living in the same town and uh just had a lot of fun um doing all kinds of you know demos and, and meetings and just having a good time so uh, again just sharing you a notes on the uh, sort of internal jokes here um in the game uh alternate reality <laughs> the dungeon <laughs> i have made a teleporter so you can move around to a number of rooms and there is a riddler in one of the rooms so in the trainer the it actually says riddler and then inside parentheses is of it says of active question mark <laughs> <laughs> yep all right uh so Demo code, <laughs> one of the more yeah. no- notable productions, the Utec people. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a word joke. Does that really work outside of Swedish? Ah <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't. So, so tech, everybody knows tech, and and U being sort of negating that. But thing is, Utec, not spelled like that, but uh, but pronounced like that in Swedish means scary. <laughs> <laughs> and you did most of that yeah yeah i did and i guess you had and a c6 to a c uh c 128 because a few of the demo parts yeah. actually work better or the only works yeah. in in 128 mode is that using the uh what is that vc vc ram or the uh, extended ram or the two megahertz mode or two megahertz mode yeah okay so, so actually yeah and there yeah no, there is actually another demo called uh, Jaskosen, which is even cooler on the CC C one twenty eight because it uses the VDC magic to expand the screen, uh, produce some weird colors. But uh, so uh, having it having a C one twenty eight was uh, not that common, <laughs> I guess. Mm. So, but I have one. Um, as a That's cracker, why. you needed to have one because uh, then you can turn the two megahertz mode for crunching, and the crunching yeah. at half uh, or double the speed made a lot mm. of difference. If the cruncher took like eight hours rather than or yeah. four hours rather than eight, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I I totally subscribe to the idea of of running stuff on 128 <laughs> in C64 <laughs> mode, though. I I have never yeah. used the other modes basically, so. <laughs> You boot them by mistake sometime. Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there, there is a hardware project. Uh, I, I don't know how this yeah. is tied to Contiki, but the final Ethernet that you did with Trasher, yeah. Yeah. do take us through that one because that is sort of touching your scene personality versus your professional and academic career as well. They, they tie into definitely. One. Oh yeah, very much so. So this was so uh, Peter and me we were studying at the same university. So we had, and uh, I was doing uh, kind of software mm-hmm. and he was more into hardware mm-hmm. uh, and uh, hardware design. He, he works now as a, as a chip designer. And he was always you know, talking about how cool it would be to make an ethernet card for the C64. Uh, and we never, never did really much about it back then like in the 90s but then we got together and because we were then working pretty close together in the same part of town in stockholm and we used to get get together for lunch just you know and we started talking about this mm-hmm. and we said hey it would be pretty cool to make a uh, an ethernet card and i said hey you know i actually i used a bunch of these really simple ethernet chips uh in my professional life mm-hmm. so it wouldn't be that hard to adapt the software to this uh, to this hardware hmm. and uh, we set out to build uh, 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 the world's first ethernet cartridge for the Commodore 64 using uh, so so Peter you knowing the hardware side designed hard, you know, hardware board and I built the software for this we got it working uh, my IP stack worked did its, its thing we had the first demo of this was using uh, the data set 
cassette recorder as a sampler tied into the software on the C64, connected mm -hmm. to the internet via Ethernet. Mm -hmm. And we could press play on the tape recorder and it would stream data, stream the sound using what was done, the state-of-the-art real audio yeah. over the internet. Yeah. So you could actually go and it had a web server on it. So you can go to the web server, click a little button, and it will stream over real audio, super, super crappy sound yeah. <laughs> from the cassette player. Yeah. It was extremely bad quality. But it worked, and that uh, that was uh, that was the world's first uh, Ethernet connected Commodore sixty four. And and what and, is the relation between this and the RRNet for retro replay? Yeah, that was that was a kind of a clone of, of the, the the final Ethernet. Our Ethernet card was uh, adapted to run on the uh, retro replay. So it, it's not so that you had sort of a relation with Jens Schoenfeld and he took over the project and, and productified uh, it or? Yeah, well, I guess slightly like that. I mean, he, he was he came to ask us if he could do it, do it. And of course, you know, we said, sure. I mean, we were we were doing this as a fun thing. It was like it's like a demo. I mean, just pushing the limits. Mm. And but he was he was interested in kind of building something for real. Oh. And uh, so it's. Uh, it was the, the same Ethernet chip. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was mapped to slightly different uh, addresses, but but that was it. Mm. Okay, so um, and your I guess your code runs in um, in the retro replay then um, for using oh. the. Uh, I guess he didn't produce his I... own IP stack, right? So. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I actually I don't know, but I I know that one of these four. Uh, I guess it's the retro replay that has this. It has another Ethernet, like like for for loading data, not mm -hmm. through the C64, but like emulating uh, a, a disk drive over mm -hmm. Ethernet. And I think that one definitely uses the light magnetic stack. So, uh, but so every time you load something, like that mm -hmm. that's uh, it's my code in there. Cool uh, stuff. Cool stuff. Yeah. And and Contiki was after this so the final Ethernet yeah. was already there because you needed the hardware yeah. otherwise yeah. the ip aspects of contiki <laughs> wouldn't really make any sense exactly yeah so that was the kind of the uh maybe year prior to contiki right okay and then basically nothing happened for quite some time and then 2022 you had the release of journey as edison that's something <laughs> that sort of was produced as part of the pre-edison thing at uh peto treasure's place and the yeah <laughs> you presented the infamous poke 56576.1 which is uh, what <laughs> chat gpt told you to do uh, yeah. to get rid of the border and it actually worked hey <laughs> how about that <laughs> <laughs> no it doesn't so just, just to be really clear no it doesn't <laughs> yeah that was that was interesting that was actually started off as a i, I was playing around with chat gpt when it Story kind of become big yeah. and just asking random questions because it, it was fun. Uh, so actually, one of the questions I asked was, who holds the record for getting up early in the morning? Yeah. And I got an answer. And yeah. it was some Indian guy huh? who had gone up at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> that was, the, that was huh? the record. Bizarre answer to a bizarre question. So, so, uh, and then I asked, you know, about Commodore 64 things, because uh -huh. I, I figured that it, it would have a chance to actually have some of that encoded in its big uh, kind of matrices. And it did actually produce a bunch of answers, mm. all wrong, hilariously yeah. wrong. Yeah. And it would just keep going. And it's, I mean, ChatGPT is, is so cool, but it is often just often so wrong. Oh, yeah. And this was one of these cases. So asking it how to do, how do you just open the borders and get, 120 colors and it would say hey just enter this poke yeah. <laughs> press run stop and restore and enter the poke <laughs> and i mean it's the swedish expression kill listening is a bit of this when uh, when yeah. you are really really confidently saying something but you have no idea mm. <laughs> like, no idea. you're just yeah. guessing but yeah you get away with it sometimes you get away with it because you're saying it with such confidence that's kill oh, yeah yeah. Oh, yeah. That is, and uh, that really is the basis of ChatGPT. I mean, ChatGPT is like someone who read a lot about something, 
oh. has no idea what it is, but has read about all the words. Mm -hmm. And if you ask that person something, that person can just spew out the words in sort of the right order, mm -hmm. which is exactly what ChatGPT is, right? It's oh. just a bunch of words in the right order. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> and sometimes yeah, it no, really makes sense, and sometimes yeah. not so much. <laughs> so it's a uh, yeah, definitely hit and miss. Oh. Okay, so the plan now is sort of a go into uh, the uh, demo watching thing. So let's move over cool. to sharing my screen here. Uh, that would be this. All right. I, right. Ho I hope yep. this worked. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> this, this is I the error prone, <laughs> prone part of the process. So uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, uh, I shouldn't do that. I should possibly do this. So this is no sprites. Yep. And just say pause or something. Give me a sign and I will pause. Otherwise, I will just run it. I hope the the background. I guess you could you could pause it right away, actually. Yeah. Just to start out just now. Yep. So the kind of the backstory to this demo, first off, is yep. that there is a, an annual competition, or not really annual, but but it's been going on for a couple of years at CSDB called the no sprite sorry that the only sprites compo uh with the aim is to have a bunch of demos that only uses sprites mm -hmm. that doesn't use any graphics or text or bitmap or anything mm -hmm. just sprites uh, you may also use some other registers but only sprites mm -hmm. and i thought it would be fun to have a demo with just no sprites because you're allowed by the rules you're you may use sprite. i mean there is no requirement to ever use one sprite you should just use so uh thought this would be a fun thing to do like demo with, with no sprites at all only using the other tricks to produce pixels and colors on the screen <laughs> uh, the whole point the whole point with this is restrict the ability to use uh, a number of the aspects <laughs> and you yeah and basically the only thing they left you also excluded and did uh, everything exactly. else <laughs> so this is this is weird but uh, i mean weird in in the, the most positive way you can possibly use the word so uh, yeah yeah should we run it again no actually let's keep yeah. it right there cuz yeah. so the this was it was actually written in about a uh, a week so uh, i think the deadline was maybe friday ish I started this on like Monday morning, and uh, I was I actually reached out to the guys in Bonsai, who's been consistently uh, performing extremely well in this compo. They've been mm -hmm. kind of dominating it, winning it, uh, having multiple entries, and just producing some really really good demos. And I I, I was checking in with them to see if they were planning to produce something because I was kind of thinking mm, maybe maybe it's not going to be a, such a big thing this year or. And uh, I, so I talked talk to Trap, and he said, uh, we're sort of thinking about it. I mean, it's, the, the time is kind of tight, but we sort of started last, you know, this this weekend. And then I said, hey, I got to go for it as well. And we said, hey, game on. <laughs> and we, we went out to on our sep two separate kind of uh, <clears throat> countries even uh, to do this and ended up extremely tight uh, mm -hmm. competition between top one and two places so uh this actually this demo one the bonsai demo came came in at number two but extremely tight uh it would have been uh you know i i guess their demo they did have sprites so it would probably have been a better uh winner but anyway so anyway what we're seeing now on the screen is really subtle because uh there are if you look to the right and the left border yeah, there are great, a few dots, dots right here I don't know if yep. my mouse pointer is visible on the. Do you see my mouse pointer? I see it. Yeah. Okay. So here, so, uh, so it's um, one set of, of pixels and one set of pixels, and then like a more dense set of pixels, yep. and basically a mirror here on the other side. Yep. So there is a. It's kind of a dither pattern, and uh, which is actually not trivial to do because you have this the uh, bad lines uh, every eighth line, so it's uh, pretty tightly. Uh, timed this, but it's really just there uh, to make a, a basic fader that doesn't actually do anything with the characters. <laughs> I mean, 
we're not allowed to do anything with the counters. So mm -hmm. it has to be, but then it goes away. So yeah, you can, you can unpause now. Yeah, okay, pause I need here. I need to pause here because this is something I yeah. love this. I don't know, <laughs> but I do have this thing about big characters. Uh, I, I love yeah. the initial Eskos scrollers with the massively big characters where you can have basically like three characters on the screen and it filled yeah. the entire screen. And this is basically a, a variant of that by using those sprites, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree very much. I think it's it's great. Just those very, very in your face letters are great. And and this is down. Uh, what we're seeing here, here on the screen now is, is done with no sprites, only the ghost bite. Uh, I guess only the ghost bite, actually, there is nothing else. So um, I, I my guess and tell me if I'm totally wrong here, because I'm, yeah. I, I will do a guy guessing here as well. So uh, splits. <laughs> Standard splits, changing the, I guess you have closed the actual screen. So this is just splits, right? No. The screen is open. Yeah. The screen is open. Okay. But because, this one, the ghost bites. this one is the, oh yeah, yeah, of course. So this yeah. one is a ghost bite. This is the, yeah. uh, the last bite of the Vic bank and you are giving it a new shape and somewhere here. There is basically an inverse, but that one is using black and black, so you never see that, right? So, actually, I think it's really just the ghost bite. I think that the the background color is always uh, blue, light blue, and uh... it's only the ghost bite being split. So, the you're absolutely right about the kind of in the right corner there, uh, where it's it sets it sets on every line a new one right before the border, so we only see the first eight pixels. Mm. Um, because otherwise, the problem with the ghost bite is that it gets repeated, right? But this one is only visible for eight pixels. Uh, and then the big, right there, right in the, in the middle of the end, uh, the ghost bite is, is set to zero. Mm -hmm. So that's when you see the background color through it. Uh, so and, this, is, and, uh, uh, this is ghost bite set to FF, and this is yeah. ghost bites being set to something else, uh, a different value exactly. on a different line. And you're yeah. not bending here. Would that be no. possible to bend it inside? They wouldn't, right? Because then it would repeat. It would, yeah, it would be trickier. Uh, it is actually possible to do something like that with. Uh, I think you can set. Uh, I think that the trick is to do something like set DO eleven to uh, one of the one of the illegal modes, uh, which also produces a black kind of black pixels. Mm. And then when you open up that by changing the DO eleven. That one actually gets delayed by two cycles. Mm. So you have a chance to do something with that. So I think there there might be a, a, a opportunity there to do something, but it was not. I mean, this was, again, this is done in just a few days. So right. it was just going to do it and fire and forget. <laughs> that looks it's... good. And if the screen is a bit jerking, it's because it's uh, my my computer is doing a lot, and uh, so it's absolutely <laughs> not jerking. And on if you watch this on the real machine, okay. So you can pause it here. Yeah. yeah. So this one is uh, is only uh, setting the do twenty. So the, the now the now the screen is blank. Mm -hmm. Now the screen is blank, and this is just updating the color register. Uh, mm -hmm. And you do have the uh, gray dot bug. If you're, this exactly. is using the new Vic, which means that whenever you store into Do Twenty, you would have this gray line. So, yeah. And it, in this case, it it would actually be possible to forego this to just not store the the, the blue again, mm. and then we wouldn't have the kind of the, the lines like that. Mm. And. Uh, but I kind of like this. It looked like a compartmentalized water flowing through, like uh, inside of a, a ship's hull, where you have those compartments to avoid overflowing if if there's a damage to one. And they I, have, but here they all been damaged. I, I would say it's more a simulation of the Panama Channel, where you have uh, oh yeah the dams, and uh, mm. you would you would go down, and they would link two oh, yeah, of them, and that. you would go out. So yeah, 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 true. Oh, more. <laughs> but, but anyway, yeah. yeah, we can say also that the reason why there are only like two colors here is that there are actually three colors. It's the light blue, the blue, and the black. 
And uh, the code here is basically only a, a long string of STX DO20, STY DO20, STA DO20, and then a piece of code that goes in and changes those from STA to STY and STX, depending mm -hmm. on how the where the wave is. Oh, so that's why and you that's need uh, three colors because we have three registers. Yeah. You store the colors exactly. in the beginning and then, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So you couldn't do it with, with more, uh, not with a being so tight. So I, I would try to avoid saying clever because everything would be clever. So uh, it would be kind of repetitive if I said the same <laughs> word <laughs> again and again. But uh, yeah, that was clever. <laughs> So I can pause right here. Yeah. So this is this one is is pretty cool because uh, it uses the uh, Vic gray dot bug to kind of outline the F, the L, and the T here. You can sort of see them slightly uh, as the uh, the raster bar kind of is behind them, <laughs> and and it it looks pretty good. Actually, uh, even better on the the real hardware because the lines are a little thinner. And they are kind of almost flickering a bit, so it looks really good. Um, and then we have the, the kind of the the, the uh, color shifting thing on them, which is kind of simple, really. It's uh, but it looks really good, which is uh, uh, a table based lookup for the different shades. So the the what well, we're, we're we're now seeing this as a kind of a still frame, but when you run it, you'll see the the uh, three layers. Uh, will light up in different colors so you can just run it but see. also the back the background the the uh the yeah. bars here i mean for me if i tried to count the color it would be more than the standard 16. so uh is there any trickery on creating more colors here or is that just clever selection of, of colors uh, that eventually yeah, so this... sort of blend a bit together yeah definitely i mean this is this is really kind of standard raster bar colors here uh but the 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 pal uh in combination with the vic chip will, will actually blend the two two together so that's why they look so good uh but they're just standard raster bars there's nothing magic here right so let's run again now we see the the mm. fading on the letters in sync with the music of course yeah, that's Fagolus, right? It is. It is. Fig, so yeah. actually, yeah. If you pause it right here, we can talk a bit about the music. So the music here is by by Fagolus Figa, and it's uh, originally it is a uh, compo tune that he called Demo Seniors that I think won Gubdata twenty twenty two twenty one ish something, and uh, it's. One of those, it, being a compo tune, it was never used for a demo. It was just a, you know, mm. just a, a tune. Mm. Uh, except it's a really, really good demo. Tune. It has this, uh, it, like, the, like the flow of the, the, the music works really, really well. Uh, it's The beat is good. Uh, it has a very distinct ending, uh, which is, I mean, if you, if you, doing music for the sake of doing music you kind of end up with a, usually a nice uh kind of flow it, it, there is this almost implied uh, or implicit uh, direction to it that they just kind of get from doing music and this is one of those songs it's a really really good demo song had never been used for a demo so in this case i this was a spur of the moment demo so i just picked a, a song <laughs> this song uh, because I've been sort of aching to use it for a demo. It was to, just that good. <laughs> and we now got it finally. And it works really, really well. I mean, it's, I mean, what makes this demo is the music. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good. But so, oh, so yeah. So that, uh, and if you see the demo towards the end, it were, just works. The, the ending is perfect. Uh, it You leave with a sense of like, like it, it 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 has this kind of heightened state of of uh, uh, mind towards them. Just works really well.
So oh, anyway, I, yeah. I, I would also say that uh, what also works really well is, I mean, if your ambition is to, to code stuff and, and make technically difficult stuff, that could sometimes look really crappy. But yeah. uh, I, I have to say that this is technically really complex stuff and some clever use of stuff that still looks really good. And, and I would say that's rather rare. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, thank, first, thank you. And <laughs> I, I think that's that's true also that it's, it's hard to make it uh, like that. I think the trick here is to make it as a music video. I mean, this this demo is like a music video, mm. and I, which I, I really like that approach, by the way. So mm. it makes it really easy. And uh, if you do it like that, you get a lot for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is a, a bit like the, the previous one, but here you're only yeah. storing the uh, the bars when you're supposed to show them. Yeah. You're not storing them. Otherwise, you would have those, uh, those uh, vertical bars, but you don't hear. Exactly. Yeah. But, so this this one is a kind of a variant of the last one, oh. or the pre previous one. But as you see, like if you pause it right here, you see that there is some flickering going on, and what happens is that it's actually so the the problem is that we need to set the color registers, and we can't do that faster than four cycles. That's kind mm -hmm. of the best we can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and here it uses those two colors, so or three colors: black and then blue and and lilac. And uh, then it flickers between two starting points in like cycle space. So we get this kind of half, uh, halfway um, point between those, those two four cycle spread apart. So we get actually two cycles apart, which makes it way smoother. And it, it works well. And I usually flickering doesn't really look that good, but it does here. So it works well. Let's see that. Yeah, it looks a bit crappy on the the emulation here, but it looks oh. really good on the real harbor. And this is two shades of gray, right? So, yeah, something like that. Here is uh, brown and and uh, green. This one's a little more obvious what what's actually going on. And yeah, I can pause it right here. So this one is uh, simply setting the uh, background color register. Oh. at the correct point on each raster beam. So you wait to the right point, set it, and immediately reset it to zero. So we get uh, four four characters wide or four cycles wide uh, uh, kind of bar on the screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so ev every second line, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is, is computing the sine wave for the other second raster line. And the other second raster line is just going to be displaying it by, by waiting to the right point, setting, resetting it, waiting it out again to the next uh, uh, raster line. So it just does that over the screen. But I mean, doing that dynamically is is that sorcery. Uh, I, um, also, I could have a stable raster, and <laughs> I can do that wave. I, I could implement yeah. that wave, but changing it dynamically while you run it is. That's when it becomes sorcery. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not that hard. What you have in this case is like no, but seriously, it's like forty-eight versions of the same routine timed to different points in the on the raster line. Oh, yeah. They yeah. jump to the right one. Yeah. So yeah. it's uh, it's easier than what it looks. But I, I see your point. I mean, definitely see how how you do it. But it's not that hard. <laughs> it looks amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And the sine wave is pretty complex too because it uses addition of two, kind of two sine waves, so we can get this nice pattern. But the resolution is—you uh, couldn't have the resolution. I mean, it's it's one character, so it's eight pixels. Yeah. That is that is why you have those. Um, yeah, it's, exactly. it's a bit blocky. There, there is no way you could do yeah. anything like that. Anything else than that, so. Right, that's the best thing we do with this technique. And of course, you add two, but uh, it's yeah. like every second line. So exactly. So it's a, it's an easy one. We just uh, it's a matter of updating the sine wave to the right uh, index. So this one is pretty cool, though. This is different. So this is doing uh, the Vic gray dot bug all mm -hmm. over the screen, or 
not all over the screen, but like half the screen. So what, what happens is that underneath this, there is just code doing two things, setting the color register of the background color to zero and waiting in between. And uh, at the start of this, and they're, the waiting is going to randomize. So the first lines have uh, next to no wait time between each setting of the, the background register. And the further down we get, the longer the wait uh, times are. So we get this kind of dither uh, feeling, They're like more dots towards the top and fewer dots towards the, the bottom. And uh, then this whole piece of code is kind of shaken back and forth, also using some randomness. So when you see it, the effect becomes like you get a, like a cloud of dots, mm -hmm. more of them on top, up, up top, and then fewer of them down below. And at this point in time, the music also kind of goes down a bit in, in energy. So we've seen all these things moving a lot. And then we have this little cloud just kind of comes up. So it kind of works pretty well. And what we're seeing now, this is different though. This is another effect. This is not the gray dot buck, even though it could seem like it is. Uh, but it surely, really... surely, surely it does look like that. But the pixels are a it bit does. too big to be gray dot, right? Exactly. Yep, they are. So they are not gray, gray dots. They are, uh, the color that we're seeing is actually the background color. And uh, we see that through a layer of ghost bites. And the opening that we see, so the ghost bite register is set to FF. It's oh. all black. And at the start of each line, we set the uh, scroll register to, to you know, a little offset. And at the right point in, in the line, we set the scroll register just a little bit more, two pixels more. And what happens is that the Vic chip will then just push those bits out and will display the background color for two pixels. Uh, and that's what we see. That is, and then the, that's the panoramic trick. The, the, yeah. the thing that opened the eye uh, in the panoramic exactly. uh, in, in Mentalic. So just yeah. used in a totally different context. So it looks totally different, but the, the, yeah. the general sort of Vic trickery is the same then. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's again. This is very similar in terms of the, how the, the kind of the the, uh, the sine wave is generated as the other effects with the, the flowing sine wave, except it's not setting the color register; it's setting the, the scroll register instead. But and we see that at some point. I think yeah. Now we see the the background color is kind of fading. Face. Yeah, because it's not a great out bug. And we get another sine wave there same thing just uh yeah just a different sine wave and we can pause that here so this is again a similar effect except this is a bit different because we're seeing so the left side is timed to this the sine wave uh, but then the right side is has another uh has another movement so this what it actually is is that the, what we do every other line is waiting to the right point in the raster bar uh, sorry the raster line to set a color in the color register and then, then we wait for a variable number of, of cycles to set black the black color again so we see that the the width of these bars is actually changing across mm. the screen here you would so, have yeah. uh, normal four cycles, and this is more like eight cycles, I guess. So something I'm, like that. I, yeah. I'm I'm sure there would be six cycles, like here, somewhere in between. And... Yeah, and it's just a computed by a sine wave function uh, as well. But it kind of looks nice. It's a bit blocky, but it it's pretty cool anyway. Uh...
and since this isn't sprite, uh, you can put it in the border and it's super easy. But but this is different because this is yeah. anything but blocky. Yeah. So we've seen those blocky guys. Now we see this super smooth guy. Huh? And uh, this one is is done using a different trick. Uh, it's kind of similar to the uh, to the uh, uh, ghost bite opening up, uh, seeing the underneath uh, psych, uh, background color. Uh, so <clears throat> what we're what we're looking at now is is uh, a screen with so it's not a blank screen it's, it's a screen with actual like it's an open screen uh, and we see the background colors uh, that's the colors that we see and all the black is ghost bites so what we're seeing is we're setting ghost bite to to ff like black uh, on the left side and on the right moment on the screen. We're setting the ghost by to zero. So what happens then is that we see at that point we will see the, the background color uh through uh which and then we change the background color every line. But and then immediately set the ghost by uh back to black again. And what happens is if you if you only do that, you get a very similar effect to to the, the ones that we saw before, the kind of the blocky movements. Mm. Except there is no Vic grade out bug because we're not actually updating a, a color register. We're updating only the ghost bytes. So uh, the uh, the the eight the eight pixel uh, granularity is done using timing, and then the uh, sort of the fine tuning of that is using the uh, the ghost byte. Then actually, the fine tuning is using the scroll register. Okay. So that's the trick. I mean, that's the that's kind of how this is done. That's how you get the the smoothness of this, because the scroll register has the uh, ability to push this any number of of between zero and eight, uh, seven pixels. So when that, you have the yeah, and that also changes the ghost bytes. So it's also scrolling ghost bytes as it would have scrolled yes. uh, characters. Any other, yeah. So that is that is the trick. It's it's kind of simple when you when you sort of know it, uh, but it's like getting it to this position is is the trick. Uh, and um, yeah, so that's why it's so smooth. You we really that the code what the code is doing is setting the background color, uh, setting the scroll register to the kind of the fine grain. Uh, mm -hmm. sine wave here, uh, wait into the right point on the raster line, opening up the ghost pipe, resetting it back again, waiting out the raster line, and computing the next uh point of the sine wave, and then do, re just doing that over, over and over again. That's not how I thought it would work, but yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, and it looks <laughs> super smooth as well. So, yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, we. Uh, this one, you can wait until it falls down. Let me see oh. the full thing. So this little picture here is done entirely in ghost bites. Uh, so and colors. It's setting. No. Uh, yeah, ghost bites that are split uh, across the screen, and we get these kind of dither patterns. Um, and and if you kind of look out and and kind of squint a bit, you can see it, it's it's a uh, an image of a snowman uh, that was actually drawn by TNG for a Christmas demo, but uh, I had it lying around and looked really nice here. <laughs> and so this this one is is really I mean it's just a picture converted into grayscales and. Uh, then generated code that sets the ghost byte at the right point in uh, the raster lines. So again, the code is pretty straightforward here. Uh, it's, uh, but it looks nice. <laughs> but th this is also the picture we talked about when you're actually also cheating, 
cheating. Uh, you, you're using more trickery because on every second line you are using the. You're not setting like storing everything in one line. On every second line, or you are storing here, and then you're using two characters to the right or left. Yeah. So you're using like a, a little offset there that uh, makes it increases the visual resolution by uh, by a factor of two. Exactly. Yes. So if you look closely, you see that there are all all the kind of the black and the white lines are four characters or four cycles wide. But uh, because the the because of the dither pattern, it works. Like mm -hmm. you said, every other line is is offset by two cycles, and uh, it looks like the resolution is two cycles, which it of course cannot be. No. No, <laughs> that's the whole thing. You're supposed yeah. to make it look like something it couldn't be, like the nine exactly. sprites and whatever. So, yeah, uh, yeah. This is also impressive trickery. <laughs> yeah, now we're seeing those are just great odd bugs, like a star field, oh. but the other direction upwards. And what we're seeing here is simply these are just ghost bites. Yes, here, uh, this one I understood, because this is storing yeah. the ghost byte just here, which makes it so basically this pattern is repeating, but because there is a border, you don't see it. So this is why yeah. it looks like uh, you have the opportunity of setting characters to that is like eight pixels wide. Exactly. Um, the only the only real trickery here is well, we need the, the timing to set the, the uh, kind of the stars. Mm -hmm. and uh, then scrolling the scroll has to be done kind of while showing the scroll because there are no other there's no raster time left mm -hmm. on the screen but pretty straightforward otherwise but the thing on the left that still goes by here as well right so yeah so you, you have this thing here and where you're doing the inverse of what you have here so there you have only the first oh, character being because you're storing it three characters out and it's extending one yeah. character in. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but the main thing here is that the music is working so well with this. I mean, and uh, it kind, of, kind of ends like that with the music and it sounds great. Oh. So that's uh, the the real you know, the, the music is what carries the demo definitely that's so great uh that was that and now are we going to <coughs> excuse me see what we have here so this is the ghost and uh i still have a bit of an apology to do here because this uh, this demo is uh Firelight in collaboration with genesis project and uh do tell about the, the collaboration here with uh with the gp guys yeah so this started actually at <laughs> fjalldata 2022 um uh, or 23 23 when <clears throat> i was i was giving a talk on ghost bites and how to produce those kind of weird looking things like unexpanded scrollers and border graphics that shouldn't be possible. And uh, it was, uh, you know, these things are really, really hard to grasp. It's in a way it's simple, but getting to the point where you can see, I, I mean, it can, can be easy to kind of understand how something is done, but getting to the point of actually producing that thing or something new is really, really hard. And as evidenced by the fact that there are just very few people uh, that have done these things over the years. I mean, the, the kind of the basic stuff has been around for ever. Everyone has known about this, uh, except it's just hard to make something useful of it because of the, the weird and, and difficult limitations. And so I had this, gave this talk on kind of how this was done. And in the audience was, uh, of course, Red Crab from GP who is the uh, organizer of, of Fjalldata and who's uh, a, like one of the best graphicians out there. And he was kind of listening in and uh, came back to me sometime after and said, hey, you know, I, 
I really kind of like this ghost bite thing. In fact, I, I liked it so much that I, I've drawn a couple of fonts using this technique. Whoa. Which is really cool because very few people have ever done that. Like mm. that's a, uh, uh, many have tried and, and very few have succeeded. Like, but, but even actually not many have tried only very few people have <laughs> tried mm. even it's, and he was, and they were using that for the, for next level by performers. That was the winning demo at X that year. Uh, super cool. And he said, but Hey, I have a bunch of these cool ideas and I was just going to check with you what you think of them. Like, is this even possible to do? And we were going back and forth and, and uh, look, you know, the stuff that he has had made was incredible. Like fonts, graphics, ideas, things that were insanely cool. And I don't know who, who of us said, you know, we should like make a demo of this. It would be so cool. And we said it would be even maybe even cooler to think of this like make a joint Fairlight and GP demo. And this kind of hails back into that kind of age old <laughs> tussle between Fairlight and Genesis projects that sort of had been going on for some time. And I, you know, I know that this is it, it was it was serious at some point in time but it was kind of waned over time and now last year at x i mean you you know all the backstory to this and how it sort of uh at last year's x finally got sort of settled and maybe you can tell the, the audience about this because you know better than i do yeah there is a previous episode where um genesis project was supposed to uh or uh, one of the guys uh from genesis project was tasked to make the protection for uh, Gollum and sarge's game uh rubicon and uh and then tiger cracked the game and um yeah that, that wasn't very nice um that is in short what happened but there is a previous uh, episode the one uh, released next to the uh, to the x uh, part of the report so do watch that one uh, and and of course i try to still kind of keep the the energy of the uh, rivalry going uh, we should all be <laughs> friends uh, but uh, there still needs to be this little nerve where there is competition and a bit of aggression yeah yeah oh yeah <laughs> Uh, definitely. And uh, there is this uh, uh, with with this demo, which would then be like the first joint oh. FLT GP demo ever. I mean, there is one, there is one. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's what even called rivalry, uh, but oh. where, where FLT and GP are, but are in the same demo with, with a bunch of other people. So it's not really a fully joint demo like that, but this would be like the first. And uh, the theme of the demo is very much it has to do with impossibility mm. like and uh there is this character uh we know only as a ghost which is kind of an embodiment of that little voice in your head that kind of helps you push through when you have to do things that are impossible like doing really really hard things and how you know people have for thousands of years been doing these really, really impossible things, like taking that journey across the sea or walking across that next hill or, you know, doing these impossible things or, or like taking care of your, you know, your people and care for the, your loved ones and like all these things that are just really, really, really hard to do. And then there's this little voice in your head that tells you to, you know, push through. That's the ghost. Like that is the embodiment that we're seeing in this demo. So, so this was kind of the, the backstory to to uh, to the demo. And of course, Red Crab had really, you know, the if, in terms of you know what is that, that makes this demo so special. That is Red Crab's ghost bite stuff. Yeah, that's what what really kind of makes the demo. And so the rest is cool too. Just just so I've said it, Andre, your contribution here is massively good and you are a super competent graphician and we appreciate appreciate everything you do. And if I have said anything that could be interpreted in any other way, 
that is not my intention because you are a cool guy. Okay. Yeah, and, so and, and, and I need and, it. I needed to get that out of the system. Yeah. No. Yeah. Definitely. I, I, and but but I think that the whole kind of the whole thing with the, this demo is is based around these ideas of, of mm. like doing the impossible, making those stuff. You know, the the the, the stuff that that simply shouldn't be possible to do, mm. and the demo was extremely well received in that regard. Uh -huh. Like the the at the party, the people seeing it was, I think. Uh, you hear the crowd reactions to uh, the stuff that just shouldn't, it shouldn't be possible to do this, but yeah. we do it anyway. And and then we had, so Fiegel was, was doing the music and towards the, uh, kind of when we were running up against the, the clock, uh, uh, Red Crab felt that he, yeah, it was initially his intention to to do all the graphics, mm -hmm. but uh, he felt that he wouldn't have the kind of the time and energy. So we invited uh, the Sarge and Pal uh, into this uh, into this, and you know the the stuff that they did was incredible. Uh, and, and the end is, uh, I mean, it, it's it's the kind of demo that people might might think to be a kind of code demo thing, but it's not really. It's really a kind of graphics uh, demo. That's where that's where it shines. So, yeah. but uh, let's, both, let's both the con both the contributions of Pal and and the Sarge here they are exceptionally good. Mm -hmm. I mean the 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 ending picture is is fantastic, and I and I really that like red... the the stick thing as well. So, yeah, that's Red Crab though. The the last one is Red Crab. Okay, yeah. But uh, Pal did the uh, the the staff thing, no? He, he Pal did the panoramic uh, picture. Okay, you have to tell me which one is his. Yeah, we'll we'll go through the demo. We'll see. Yes, it. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> can we now? We can start. So yes. So just to clarify, here you are allowed to use sprites and graphics. <laughs> oh, so nice, so nice. <laughs> so let's see. Keep, keep the finger on the pause button because uh, in a in a few seconds you can, you can unpause it now. But in a few seconds, we need to pause it, like now. Okay. So this is the first thing to note here. This is actually the first time ever this effect is seen. Uh, so what we're seeing is a kind of a gradual fade out of the colors of the kind of light blue color go going to black and with a dither effect, which is very fine grained. It goes, it's a single pixel thing. <clears throat> it goes all the way from the top to the bottom, all the way out into the borders. And uh, this is, again, this is the first time this is seen, ever done before. Uh, but it flashes by like half a second. Uh, the trick here is let me guess the black pixels. Yeah, the the sure. middle the middle part is is the ghost bite, and then you have yeah. uh, high resolution sprites in the border on the left and yeah. the right. Yep, yeah, definitely. That is that is the way this is implemented. And there is some trickery needed to get the cycles working because uh you need to set this you need to set both the ghost bite pattern. And it, that needs to be set in the border. And the sprite pattern needs to be set before the border. And then it has to be updated before the next border start, kind of for the left one starts. Oh. And then there's this gradual thing as well. So it's actually pretty tricky to make this guy. But, but uh, you only need one sprite, or uh, no? Yeah. You, but yeah, so the yes. sprite content on the left and the right is the same, and you only need to update yeah. like one sprite set, and then you can show it in two different locations. Yeah. So it's uh, that's the that's kind of the main trick. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. You. you see it flashing <laughs> through for a second or two, and then uh, there is so much thinking behind that little thing. And yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I know a number of people who are reasonably sk skilled coder who wouldn't be able to pull this off. 
And if they did it, it would be a sort of their magnum opus and they would be proud of it for the rest of their <laughs> lives. But you do it as like a, a little fade effect here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. we can pause it right here. So this, what we're seeing now is just this kind of sprite zoomer and overlaid with ghost bites for the, the dither. So uh, as the, the sprites kind of move into the distance, the dither goes away. And as the sprite moves forward, the dither is there. Uh, and uh, it looks really nice. And it, the dither makes it so that you see the individual pixels that it moves up close. So it looks pretty cool. And this one is by the Sarge, but it's the the font is actually by by, by Red Crab. So it's this is Red Crabs as well. And this picture is uh, high res plus sprites. This is the first time we see the ghost, and then we see the ghost's staff coming up. This is again. And it took uh, me it took me so long. You can see the names here. Yeah. It says Fegol Hus, <laughs> I guess, and there is yep. Trident there, and there is uh... Red Crab. Red yep. Crab. Yeah. I read, I read it as Hobbit. <laughs> Sorry for <laughs> my, a, my yeah. fair lad bias here, but of course it says Red Crab. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually saw Trident first, and then only after seeing yeah. that I saw the rest. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah, because those are uh, rune letters, right? So they look a bit different. And uh, this was also drawn before that says red crab right there. It's RC and, there, yes. Yeah. So this is this is drawn before the Sarge and Pal mm. came into the, the demo. So that's why there are only like three names. But uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. I, I this one I actually thought was done by uh, by Pal, but uh, I, I see now okay. it's red crab. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, lovely, lovely picture, and all yeah. extending into the border, uh, oh, yeah. up and down, and with, but but uh, th that's requiring less trickery because I mean you're not using the entire border, so then you can have them unexpanded, and that sort of works. Yes. And if we look, if you pause the picture here, uh, we also see that the petroglyph in the background. Actually, features a ghost up to the right. Ah. So we see that our ghost has been around for a long time. It's been with us for like ever. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this, this, this might be a silly question: Is this a real one that is replicated, and the idea is taken from there, or is this just uh, making it look so? Rune yeah, style? no, no, the. Yeah, the, there is no there is no petroglyph with a ghost on it like this. It's uh yeah, petroglyph is uh so petro is, is rock, right? Yeah. Glyph is glyph. So uh it's uh so this is also done by Red Crab again, and he was like studying uh like petroglyphs to make it look like one, but the ghost is is not uh one that you'd find in the in a real petroglyph. We still haven't found it, but of course it could be <laughs> exactly out there. could be out there. Yeah, yeah. we should Great. start looking. Great. And then we see a sort of a ghost-like ghost figure with some pretty lovely colors. Just kind of <laughs> appearing. It's, it's difficult to pause because <laughs> it is because it's supposed to be like this. You should just kind of see it briefly. That one, that picture is by by the Sarge, like that, okay. that kind of plasma ghost. I, this is this is not a big thing, but that's also one of the things I love about modern demos. Normally. Um, Back when you change disk, you still needed to press space. Even the thematic yeah. demos, you still needed to press space, but no, no yeah. longer needed. Uh, it sort of continuously check if it has the new disk in the drive and eventually get that fed back to the main routine and then start. So, yeah, this um, is, by the way, the, the loader that we're using is the one by Bitbreaker. 
Mm -hmm. So he should get the credit for that part because that's really, really easy to, to just implement. Uh, you, thanks a bit, Breaker. This picture is again by, by the Sarge, but the font is by uh, Red Crab. And you can pause right here. I actually oh. missed it. Okay. <laughs> but that but was... there is another another version of that one, uh, kind of dither effect. So yeah. Sorry, missed that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but people can rewind and watch. Uh, yeah. Skip back thirty seconds and watch that again. It's it, it is in the video. <laughs> it's just not paused. So, <laughs> and this logo is by Red Crab. It's really cool how it's it, you know the 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 white space is kind of changing halfway through. So it's a fair light, and then the the parts of the the letters that are you know, light blue. Oh. They turn dark blue when you when they go down. So when you see the half of it, it just says Genesis Project, and top half says Fairlight, and then the mean the kind of between them, you see that how they, yeah. they kind of are inverted. So pretty cool. It works because the because this huge Escos logo thing uh, is there. And this was also Red Crab. Yeah. And uh, here is, this is the first, so if you pause right here. So this one is also by Red Crab. Uh, this is a very special logo. Uh, it looks like it is just like the, the normal Fjelldata logo, mm -hmm. which it is. Except if you look closely, the, the default logo doesn't have so many details as this guy. So this one has more details than the default logo. You see the the highlight on the left of the left uh, of each letter, and it's very evident how high resolution this is. Like mm -hmm. those are single pixels. If you look at the, there are single pixels all, all over this, like the the two dots over the A, right? Mm -hmm. Evidently single pixels there. Mm -hmm. So this obviously is a high resolution logo. And if you unpause it now. What happens, it starts to move and it starts to go upwards and upwards and oh my God, it went into the border. <laughs> this is entirely impossible. Like you could never have this high resolution in the upper border. Yeah, and just it to is... have, have that explained that uh, in the border, you can only have sprites and then the the eight sprites that you can have uh, at, at high resolution that would only fill like what is it like half of the border down there so well, a little bit more than half but uh, just over half so uh, yeah full high res covering the entire or being in the entire border no no you cannot do that so yeah but but it happens it here so seemingly you can so <laughs> yep and this is this is the work of Red Crab, who has made this logo using, and the trick is using a bunch of ghost bites, really, in a very, very clever fashion uh, to make this come true. Uh, this is completely, I mean, if you look at how it is done, but I mean, just looking at how the ghost bites are laid out, there is no way to figure out how it was done. Like, <laughs> it is incredibly cool, uh, insane. So this is, uh, yeah. So it's it, is, it where... is basically expanded sprites up there, but the ghost bite mm -hmm. uh, trickery is you is giving you the perception that you or it is actually uh, sort of making it high res looking. Yeah, exactly. That's where so all the high high resolution pixels are ghost bites, and then there are uh, like uh, expanded uh, sprites together with mm -hmm. those, and it's insane. Well, I mean, uh, the analogy, if this is difficult to grasp, one of the analogies is uh, a number of games would have uh, a multicolor sprite. Uh, and the, in multicolor, the resolution is, is always two pixels. And then they have a high res black outline. So that, that could be chosen so that the outline sometimes cover the left or in sometimes covering the right pixels on an underlying multicolor pixel, giving you the perception of all the colors, but with full high res resolution. So um, yeah, 
I'm not saying this is the same, but but sort of the same idea, the some same underlying idea, using two techniques on top of one another to create the illusion of full resolution. Yeah. Okay. Shall uh, we run? Yeah, you can. Get, yeah, let's go. Now we see the logo is kind of moving in the door border as well, uh, just to show that off, and that it starts to stretch just to really highlight how small those pixels are. And also to avoid any risk of this being, uh, uh, sorry, pause right here. <laughs> okay, this part that we're seeing for, I don't know, like half a second is actually the most technically challenging one in this demo. Uh, <laughs> getting, so this is, it's a uh, ghost by split in the middle and uh, two different sets of sprites, one to the right, one to the left. And it has to play out nice and it has to be timed to perfection because there is a split in the middle. So this is probably the kind of the hardest one uh, technically uh, to code. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. It's there for yeah, it's for me. I, I just saw it as okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a ghost by yeah. split. But again, you in order to have the high resolution move into the borders as well, you need to have the high res um, sprites in the border as well. So yes. Yeah. Yes, I see what you mean. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> that so became there are... a lot more difficult. Yeah. So this is actually the first version of this one ver uh, effect was in Hughes at X. Uh, but that, that was kind of the full screen thing. Uh, this one is kind of an improved version of that. So uh, it's there for like a fraction of a second. That's it. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so yeah, we can pause this. This is pretty straightforward, actually. It's not so tricky. Uh, there are uh, some really colorful sprites underneath uh, kind of ghost by uh, pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks pretty nice with all the mm -hmm. colors. And uh, it just kind of flashes by. Now we get a little bit uh, more of a ghost bite effect. So this one is kind of similar to one of the other stuff we talked about. So it's ghost bites updated every line with some colors. And then there is this kind of waiting for the right moment of the line to kind of set the ghost bite plus a bit of uh, uh, scroll register to make it smooth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. Okay, okay. Yeah. This one I understand, and uh, this one I absolutely love. Uh, I, I published the Degkrook in uh, Data Magazine, so this bending, <laughs> I guess DO17 stretch <laughs> sprite was the thing that I did, but what is done here, and this one I know I can explain, is ghost bite, bite dithering. Uh, so it, it's it's a well, it sits on top of the lower sprite and it sits underneath the higher priority sprite here. So using uh, the ghost bite here is to sort of give the impression of a shadow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I under understood this, but it's used <laughs> and implemented so nicely that it looks absolutely great. Yeah. Yeah. The, the dough hook. Definitely. And there is another oh, yeah, trick hook. here. Yeah, sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the, the, another... very, the very English term, degkrook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there is a, there's another trick here, actually. There is the middle color. So the, the left color here is lilac, four. Mm -hmm. And the right is light red, or A, 10. Uh, the middle is actually a mixture of the two. Uh, so every other line is the one and the other line is the other. So uh, that's why you get that kind of uh, middle color in between them. And it's actually visible if, uh, and like half a second, the color will change gradually. You see the effect even more. But I mean, uh, that means that this is not the U17s. So you're not stretching them. You are uh, yes, positioning. They are. They are actually stretched, but the color is updated. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. 
So that's why. Yeah, but <clears throat> it's it's really just uh two really long sprites. And you can see, and they look like uh like a rhomboid, you know, if you look at them just like that. But mm -hmm. they are stretched out. So that's why you see the the pixels at the top of the bottom. So it's kind of like just drawn out. Oops. Uh there we go. And we just now we see the color change. And now we see them. Now they're expanded in the uh, uh, X direction as well. <clears throat> and we can see the color effect in the middle. And it goes away pretty quickly. And uh, we can pause right here. So here is another world first. Uh, kind of a cool little effect. So it's a, these are kind of normal raster bars. But uh, underneath a layer... <clears throat> Of ghost bidens and sprites in the border mm. uh to make it dither mm. like they do and uh it's uh, uh yeah this is the first time this is done the trick here is to be able to set the color register at the exact right moment uh because the sprites as they are in the border uh they need to be they they are stealing some cycles in the border and they are stealing cycles all over the you know the, the border area. So we need to position the the user the correct sprite number. Uh, I mean, it, you can't use sprite seven, for example, because then that wouldn't be possible to set the color register all the way there to the left. It would bug. So it's a tricky, tricky one. Uh, but when you kind of d done it once, you can just kind of show it, use mm -hmm. it. Uh, but uh, it looks really nice. There was a previous version of this was again at Hughes and at X. Here's another one, kind of the same idea, except now the the raster bars on top are reflected mm. down below. And uh, uh, we can pause right here. This uh, is this is part excellent. of the Sarge. This is the Sarge, yes. So this is a great picture of uh, like a wet, rainy. Uh, day a uh, cozy little village and uh the the so the the backstory here is that the every year at Fialota there is a special competition for like a some effect that you should have in your demo there last year was a snow effect mm -hmm. you should make something with snow this year it was a water effect so this and incidentally, the previous raster bar thing, th this is a water effect. And the really, really tricky part here, which again is Red Crab's work, is the puddles in the lower border, which we see one of them right here. Mm. One of them is visible on the screen now. This, Those are unexpanded, this right? Little, yep. Yep. And they cover the entire area. Like, as the rain increases, we see the entire area being covered by unexpanded puddles, which isn't possible. Like you see the, the rain kind of bumps up. The music also flows up with the rain. So if you oh. pause it sometime right now, you should see that. Now there are more puddles. And uh, those are just, uh, you know, you, you can have as many of them as you'd like. Uh, again, an insane ghost by trick by by red crab i've i mean it's incredibly cool if you look at kind of the the early versions of this on the kind of the the photoshop files and how this that, that it actually works it mm -hmm. is insane you need to there are so many variables that you need to be aware of <laughs> what you make and from that make a uh you know, rounded shape and not just one round shape, but like a bunch of them that we can just plot out. Insane. So he's he's so. drawing a, a, a ghost bite layer as one of the layers in his Photoshop file, and then he paints the rest underneath to see what he wants to do. Basically, yes, either underneath or on top. And uh, because there are there are different ways of doing this, you could either be a like have it a layer on top and they have a, a, a transparency to see mm. through to the ghost bites or you use the ghost bites as a mask on top. Mm. And uh, 
the trick uh, is to use something like like Photoshop or GIMP and uh, layers. But yeah, it is insane. And, and this <clears throat> this is probably the first time that people started thinking about the, the border effect here because the picture is really, really nice. I mean, you see the picture and you're like, oh, wow, that is a cozy place. Look at the shadows and how the reflections of, look at the red reflection mm. on the staircase there. It's, mm. it's really nice. And this is high res. Mm. This is high res. I mean, if you look at how picture is used to look in a high res, they would be really blocky. They would, you know, you, you should you see it immediately that that was high risk. Here, you don't see it immediately. You start, to, you know, if you start to really look at it, you see, of course, the 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 windows are lined up along mm -hmm. character uh, boundaries, but you know, it's just incredibly good. Yeah, um, I, I guess the Sarge kind of took a liking of high risk. He's done a few uh, before, but suddenly he made yeah. a, a number of them. Yeah, there's another one coming up uh, in this demo as well. Insanely good. Now you see the rain really pushes down into the border there. And uh, there are just too many of those rings for this to be possible. But well, we do it anyway. And here we see, uh, this is kind of the variant of some of the other effects, oh. but it's really nice. So it's a kind of a um, hexagonal pattern uh done in ghost bites and sprites in the border mm -hmm. with a sort of a sunrise uh in the background and the colors will be they will sort of blend together in an interesting fashion through those little uh, lenses uh the hexagonal patterns mm -hmm. and with the music sort of coming into this um the, the the musical mode is is uh one of a kind of uplifting sound and this this after the rain then there is this kind of sunrise so it it's it sounds really nice it works really well i think and it gets brighter and brighter yeah there's a the sun is rising right and here we have so this is a just a small trick here of mine. I kind of it's a bit of the same. It's yeah. uh, it's goes by plus price in the border, and then you just showed off the fact that you had a number of cycles left, so you make splits. Yeah, splits exactly. So this one is actually quite different from the others, because uh, because there there are cycles in the middle that we don't have. We have no cycles to spare. And the others, mm. whereas here we have so those are actually just this one sprite high, so there are no do seventeen stretching or anything here. It's just uh just kind of one sprite mm. uh, with a pattern in the border, and of course we need to update the the ghost bite pattern each line, but uh, the there are just sprites in the border. And here is the so this oh Oops. yeah excellent yeah excellent yeah we can pause it. So this <clears throat> this is the scroll that I think got people really worked up at at the uh, uh, at party. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it is as you see it. Looking at that font, I mean, this looks like a regular font. Like you see it, it is a high res font. Evidently, mm -hmm. you see a bunch of like places where there are like the T and the H and the B, the D. They are evidently uh, high res. Mm -hmm. like there, are, there are no expanded pixels here. Like this little uh, exactly crescent here. That's that's yeah. obviously high res, and and you would have yeah. the same here and the same here. Yep. And this is a font done again by Red Crab, which looks very similar to his his normal styles to drawing fonts, which look a bit like this i mean there, there are there are slanted uh details on the on the characters and uh uh it's it's just a really cool looking font we've used it in the in the demo and like the screens where it has, says turn disc or part mm -hmm. one or part two but the, back then it was just normal font this guy is special now uh, if you run the demo we'll see why because now it's just uh and the message here is of course uh taken from jfk like we we do things not because they're hard, but because they're impossible. And then boom, here are, this is impossible. There is no way 
how you can do this. Like, it, no way. There are, I mean, again, those, you know, those letters up there, evidently. Hi iris here iris and iris yeah. here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not doable. There's no, <clears throat> definitely not doable. No way. There are just, uh, they, they have to be expanded when they were in the border like that. So, of course, this is done with with uh, with ghost bites again. Uh, but the the real kicker here is the quality of the font. I mean, people have been trying to do so. So this particular font is actually done by ghost bite masking. So there is a uh, there is a ghost bite layer on top. Mm -hmm. Many of the other things are done the other way around, but this one is with the ghost bites on top. So the ghost bites mask out just a few pixels here and there uh, where it would otherwise be evident that this was expanded sprites. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it is expanded sprites. I mean, they are, this is a, a screen covered by expanded sprites. And then there are these little places where the ghost bite is masking out the pixels. <clears throat> and people have been doing this for a long time. Except no one has done a font just like this. And this is insane. Uh, there has been, to my knowledge, only one font ever done with ghost bite masking like this at a two by two or, or this size. So the trick here is because the ghost bite repeats every eight pixels. It's you can sort of see yourself doing a font that where every character is eight, eight pixels wide. Like that way you can actually sort of see how you do that because you you place them out in certain and you know certain letters they kind of look alike you have a uh, uh if you look at the screen here you'd have like a, an o being similar to an a for example you can sort of put the pixels outside of the you know the fringes of that and you can do that but what we are seeing here is really a ghost by every eight pixels being repeated except the characters are 16 pixels wide hmm. so you have to take care that the same ghost by patterns that works on the left side of the letter mm. needs to work on the on the right side yeah. as well, and I don't see any glitches or problems or anything here. It's just incredibly good. And then we we had you know we took this font and to show it off, we do the greetings with it because there is no cheating with the greetings. You have every conceivable letter. Mm -hmm. in those group names yeah so you can't you can't get away with you know one character being impossible to do like an x or something but no 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 there are letters there are even digits you see here c64.com and uh it's uh and then it's pretty tricky one to program as well because there is just not a lot of raster time left the ghost bite needs to be up to every line and there is the, the color is there as well. Uh, but then we have to scroll everything. And uh, fortunately, if you actually, if you look at this in a kind of a, you see it's slightly sort of slanted. And the reason is that they're not updated at the same time. They're actually, you know, one scroll is moved uh, one frame, and then the other one is moved in this, the other frame. Oh. They don't really line up. Ah. Oh. Yeah. But, yeah, here you see the X's, by the way. Yeah, uh, Proxima there and Prosonics. Yeah, exactly. It looks really, I mean, it looks like so just enough. a good looking font. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, and uh, also, if you look closely, there is, uh, there, it's a uh, single, some of these are kind of one letter wide and some of them are two. So it's, a, you know, that it's. Ah, yeah, proportional they're... font. So the I is yeah. only one character wide and then you have yeah. S's being two okay exactly yeah so it's uh just looks amazingly good spell papan remember yeah. uh re remind oh. me that i would hand you that spell papan's book um i still right. have it yeah i still have it <laughs> and this one is by the sarge like this is iris I don't think, I mean, you can't really see it, Cyrus. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, of course, you can see the pixels are small, yeah. but you can't see the 
what normally makes a high res picture stand out is that you can sort of see the the blockiness of it. The blockiness Here, of the color usage. Uh, exactly. Whereas... Yeah. It's just so perfectly masked here. Uh, so this is the ghost just doing ghost things, like going about his <laughs> business. <laughs> and it falls into the purgatory. And so this is, if you pause it right here, so this is kind of similar to one of the things that we talked about before with uh, ghost bites. So this is done with ghost bites. Mm -hmm. And uh, the they are updated kind of like that, that uh, um, snow mound picture where they were updated, I think, uh, like every other, mm -hmm. you know, line is different. And uh, <clears throat> the trick here is to be able to do that so often as we do on the screen. Uh, so the code is actually residing in, in uh, zero page and it's self updating. Uh, so it needs to be in zero page because updating the code in zero page saves on one cycle every, every update. So it's a super tight thing. And this is the part that I think got the most cheers. So if you yes. pause it right here. So this is the eye flying into the panoramic. So this is a reference to a uh, part and metallic by panoramic designs uh, from 1991, maybe, maybe no better. Uh, I, I'm really where... bad with years, but uh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. probably one of my uh, absolute favorite demo parts. Um, yeah, I, I think I had episode 40 where I went through think twice one and five and then metallic as uh, the three demos that could be my top three. Yeah, oh, it is. It's a it, it, incredibly good demo. And this part really stands out because in the original, we you'd have so panoramic is nine letters, and they had those nine letters in the border. <clears throat> One of them was not as bright. One of them was made by by opening up a, a gap on the ghost light layer. Uh, <clears throat> and this is what so this is again one of Rudd Crab's insane ideas. He said, you know, it would be cool to remake that part by using ghost bites instead of like real sprites. Because if we do that, we get one extra sprite. So uh, the eye flying in is a reference to that ninth sprite in the original. <clears throat> so now we now that kind of flies in and sits down. If you run it again, just run the demo, we see that now well, there are seven more letters, designs coming in yeah so nine <laughs> here and and you can yeah. i mean they are but these two are the same color uh mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep yeah, yeah you start to notice those things after a while if you're really yeah. looking at it but the effects oh. as especially at the demo compo I didn't see it then. Incredible. I, I, no. I saw the nine and I saw the homage to uh, Beyond Rustin and uh, yeah. the original coder who was supposed to be at Fjell Data, but who yeah. wasn't there. That was a bummer. But uh, yeah. And then you throwing in design, just like, yeah, I can have another sprite. I just throw it in. Here. Exactly. Yeah. So the, and, and if you pause it again, so the picture here is by Pal, who is uh, friends with Bjorn. They were supposed to go together. Uh, so I was I, I asked Pal if he had any you know ideas of how to do this because the original is kind of this picture except there's no Bjorn in it. there's mm -hmm. no so big person it's just uh there's this uh, like the the sphere and the the, uh, the road there yeah. and he was like hey um uh, I you know couldn't we have like a big picture of him that would be pretty cool yeah. you draw this incredibly good picture I mean he Pal is so incredibly good at making people look good in pictures i mean he's not only is he uh yeah that's that's the r d is the original the original ah, okay so this is from the original picture Part of the, yes yeah. so what what pal did was add bjorn uh, uh picture and kind of tweak the picture so it looks like it's a flea picture 
Mm. I mean, look at the the colors. It's mm. great. And uh, those those colors, some of them were there, but but not. I mean, Pal really took it up a, a couple of oh. notches there. It's insane. And the picture, I mean, just as a, a like it, you know, technically, the picture of Bjorn is really really good. I mean, looking at where the colors are and all the borders. I mean, if you know the restrictions, you can really appreciate just the technical stuff. But it's also a really really good picture. Mm. Like he looks really good. So. Yeah. 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 So Paul, yeah. we love your stuff as well, and we love working with you. So keep it up. And yeah, we can pause it right here. So this is another version really of the same, you know, the dither fade thing. Mm -hmm. Except here we have it with different colors and it's also moving. So it's just uh yeah, you can unpause it. I think it looks nice. Now here's another version of that kind of zero page ghost by thing. She looks uh so uh red crab called this the the ghost shirt play shirt like the ghost shirt the ghost shirt yeah ah, okay. you know like a, a lumberjack's shirt yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> which it really looks like oh now this is cool this is really really cool so those ghosts are not normal ghosts uh again this is more of red crabs uh i mean it's insane work ghost where... bite sorcery thing is so they are yeah. uh, really expanded sprites and there is there would be a ghost bite effect on top of them to get the perception mm. that they are actually exactly. yes and th this one is using a different technique there's actually ghost bites underneath and uh <clears throat> the, the 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 sprites are kind of opening up uh holes in the, the sprite layer so if you keep this going uh so now this would be do doable. Like those are only four, five ghosts per line, right? But now, no, no, no. Way too many. <laughs> and they look really good. I look at the grumpy guy there. And like, oh, they're so, they're so nice. And uh, here's another one just because I really like raster bars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and this, I can pause it right here. So this was actually done at the at the Fjallo, the party. Yeah. Uh, so this is a disp. So um, except we're not opening the borders. We're we're just setting the ghost bite every every line, and uh, then the 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 font is by Pal. So we were sitting down at the party, and, and there is supposed to be like a, a more of a static disp thing here, but we said, hey, we should do something cool with this. So we started doing this uh, this font, and we were kind of ping ponging back and forth, and uh, added some zoom, some dithering. That looks really cool. And then uh, so this I, was... I, I sat next to him when he was doing this. The uh, diagonal yeah. cuts here that's also kind of make them pop. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's Paul. Just ah, it I is. have an yeah. idea. Like <laughs> I'm drawing yeah. this, and I my initial thought was ultra nah, fast. No. No, no. But seeing it, yes, yes, yes. He saw Works for... what I surely didn't. So, yeah, and it, it looks really, really good, and it works with this the the pattern that we see through mm. kind of masks out some of the expanded feeling of the of these, mm. and it's it's just nice. And now we're seeing. So this one is really easy to miss, but those you can actually le let us scroll all the way to the top and pause it right there. Especially the last line, pause it right there. Yeah, Look okay. at that, that's in the border. The, Look the at those border. pixels. Yeah, but, but those this, are unexpanded. This is actually expanding all the way to the uh border in the sides but you didn't really use it so <laughs> yeah there there is some there is some room for improvement here even yeah and uh we'll see what we make of that but for now just 
look at how wide this font this this uh picture is in the border it's again red crabs font incredible now we this is the final picture oh <clears throat> so this um this uh we see the the ghost here of course and kind of peeking at us from inside the, the printed circuit boards and uh this is uh high risk plus sprites sprites in the border sprites on the picture and raster splits in the left border. So the, the, uh, the, the see through, I, I, translucent yeah. or whatever that's yeah. called. And, uh, and, uh, oh, yeah. Andre, I mean, this, this good. is, this is an incredible picture. Uh, it is insane how, how it works with, with, uh, the transparency. The feeling is, I mean, you can see through. The, the mm. PCB behind it, and you see all the colors uh, of the ghost. And again, this is high res. Like you'd normally see a high res picture again being very kind of blocky. No, 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 not this one. Uh, it is insane. And uh, with this, the sprites actually uh, make some of the more detailed parts of this really. Uh, this The sprites is what make that work. Mm. And then we have sprites, of course, in the, the borders as well. And uh, this just looks so good as the final picture and, also at the party. And we just it just sits there until you reset now. So yeah. this is done yeah. and you're still just running it. Yeah. yeah it and you're just left with this. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Super. I think that was it. These are two yep. of the recent productions that Adam has been involved in. So uh, two absolutely impressive pieces of work. And uh, they won the competition on, uh, or they won their respective competition, I should say. So uh, uh, yeah, it was really appreciated by, by those watching it because uh, they eventually voted them. Uh, by public mm -hmm. vote they became the first so yep super super i should possibly undo that no i should stop sharing we go back to this yep so adam thank you so much i think this is also a two and a half hour episode so uh there there is a lot of things for people to digest and uh as yeah. we have tried before we try to split things into two parts which means that we have a number of people watching the first one and then only half of them watching the second one so i don't think we will do that i would think we will throw a meaty two and a half hour bone to the audience here so <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time in a fr on a Friday afternoon, and uh, I'm sure needing <laughs> a cup of coffee now. So, thank <laughs> you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great, it's great to be here. That was this week's episode, Trident of Fairlight. What a guy! What a guy! So now you know a lot more about the trickery behind two of the Fairlight uh, demos recently, or I should say that one of them is actually a Fairlight collaboration with Genesis Project. Again, super work by Red Crab there. Uh, we really appreciate that you are watching, and I would like to welcome you back next week. Bye-bye.